Hello everyone. We continue our discussion in Constitutional Law Review. We touch on public international law. We are on the first part, an introduction to public international law. The topic guide for this discussion is what is public international law? What are the sources of international law? Is international law true law? and the relationship between international and national law. What is public international law? We have a traditional definition, which is that branch of public law which regulates the relations of states and of other entities which have been granted international personality. And we have a more modern definition. It is the law that deals with the conduct of states and international organizations, their relations with each, others, with each other, and in certain circumstances, their relations with persons natural or juridical. Of course, the modern definition is an expansion of the traditional one, where the modern definition identifies international organizations, while in the traditional one, it merely states other entities which have been granted international personality. So basically, these entities are, of course, the international organizations. And of course, it includes the phrase, no, that in certain circumstances, it deals with the relation of states and international organizations with persons, which will be more explained in our discussions on the subjects of international law, while why this particular definition is significant. Traditionally, International law has been seen as a complex of norms regulating the mutual behavior of states, the specific subjects of international law. By norms, we mean the standards of behavior defined in terms of rights and obligations. What are the sources of international law? There are two categories. They are differentiated as primary sources and subsidiary sources. Now you will see how international law is different from our common understanding of what law is from the sources. What are the primary sources of international law? We have of course international treaties and conventions whether general or particular establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states. So what is the law in this particular situation? It is the treaty itself or the convention. What are the obligations? What are the rules that have been established in such treaties and conventions? And that is what is considered as to be the law between these particular states or between these particular nations. So uh, generally or principally, that is the source of international law in that particular kind of situation. And of course, we have international customs or the consistent practice of states undertaken in the belief that the conduct is permitted, required, or prohibited by international law. So international customs, of course, most of, international, of these international customs are incorporated in treaties and conventions when they pertain to the subject a particular subject which is already part of customs. Now, in order for customs to be considered as a source of international law, it must be shown that the custom is a prevailing practice by a number of states. So that in order for it to be considered as international custom, of course, it must be exercised by a sufficient number of states to bind other states which would like to be a part of that particular community. 
And another requirement is that these particular practices must be repeated over a considerable period of time in order for it to be considered as a custom okay, for a number of decades probably or for uh, time immemorial. Okay? And that it is attended by a sense of legal obligation that uh, there is a sense of that it is being required of a particular state to act in a certain way to to observe that particular practice now the third source the third primary source is the general principles of law these are the rules derived mainly from natural law observed and recognized by civilized nations such as res judicata prescription pacta sunt servanda and estopel recognized by and typically derived from domestic legal systems of states. So these are the primary sources of international law. Now the subsidiary sources would include judicial decisions, generally of international tribunals, and most authoritative being the International Court of Justice. Of course, these judicial decisions uh, these particular decisions are is based on 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 its interpretation of what the law is between and among the states in a particular situation on a particular issue what is the applicable um, treaty or convention or whether the, or not it is considered to be a customary law or not now another subsidiary source are writings of publicists which must be fair and unbiased representation of international law by acknowledged authorities in the field field no of course of the most highly qualified publicists it is not just because you are now a uh, or someone who wrote a book on public international law would you be considered as one which is acknowledged to be a publicist and therefore a subsidiary source of of uh, international law so you must be a highly qualified publicist in order to be considered as a subsidiary source of of uh, international law because we have seen the sources of international law we now come to the question of whether international law is considered to be a true law because how do we understand what law is now in the philippines in in civil law we uh, defer to the definition by sanchez roman on in, in a specific sense of what law is where he defined it as a rule of conduct just obligatory promulgated by the competent authority for the common good of a people or a nation which constitutes an obligatory rule of conduct for all its members so what sanchez roman in his definition requires is that it is promulgated by a competent authority and as i mentioned there is no such authority in international law there is no international legislative body from whence a uh, from whence the law would originate nor is there now a competent sovereign which enforces these rules and this is uh, as now um, conceptualized by john austin who requires that there must be a sovereign which enforces the rules and imposes sanctions and penalties for non-compliance and because there is no sovereign and because there is no uh, no obligatory compulsion for the um, for the state to uh, comply with its obligation and merely relying upon the uh, self-imposed um, compulsion of the state you know, to comply with the obligation that uh, 
John Austin conceptualized it as a positive international morality, merely a, a, a guideline uh, or a guide for how um, a state should act in certain situations, and therefore it does. It is not, of course, true law according to John Austin. Now, if we look at another definition of law by Justice Bradley of the U.S. Supreme Court, he says that law is a science of principles by which civil society is regulated and held together, by which right is enforced and wrong is detected and punished. And there is no conceptualization, of course, of a sovereign from which law shall originate or a necessity of a sovereign which would enforce sanctions for non-compliance. But what makes now international law true law? And this is, of course, on the, on the other the other side of the argument is that it is international it is law because these particular agreements these particular rules have been agreed upon by the states as the rule or the law that would bind them that binds them okay that uh, therefore it is law because it is recognized as law by the states themselves by by the object or by the subjects of international law so they recognize it as law and therefore it is law there is no necessity of a a, a uh, of a sovereign authority in order to enforce it now this is likened no by a a, a discussion by some no in by some uh, authors who say that well you you take it like this no like children playing in a park that when there is no teacher when there is no parent that oversees them they come to an agreement on how they should conduct themselves in the in the playground or in in a particular game okay so it is a self regulation so therefore rules can exist without a particular authority that would now enforce it so despite the fact that there is no sovereign authority there is no uh, legislature that makes the laws or there is no sovereign authority that enforces the laws which would provide sanctions for non-compliance still international law is obligatory why is it then obligatory because it is uh, implicit in the concept of an international community that international law is universal it applies to all there is no exception no state is outside the international system because we belong to one international community. New states are immediately bound by general customary law and succeeded, uh, succeed to treaties of their predecessors. The international community under international law is not only open to but also obligatory for all states. Being a member, therefore, of the international community, you are then obligated to comply with the, uh, the, the, the rules, the laws that are being enforced in this particular international community. And of course, that is the weakness of international law. No, that is the weakness of international law. If a particular state does not or fails on his obligations or reneges on, in his obligations under the uh, under a treaty or a convention or contrary to what is required by customary law how how do you punish and how do you sanction this this particular state when there is no sanctioning body when there is no no sovereign authority that would now sanction that particular body so that is one of the weaknesses of 
of uh, international law. Unlike, of course, in domestic laws, where you have, of course, the government that would enforce it and provide sanctions for non-compliance of the law. How is then international law relate with or interact with our national law or municipal law? There are different concepts to consider here. Now you ha we have uh, the dualism and uh, monism concepts where the dualists approach uh, views of international and national laws are as two distinct systems, two separate systems that exist independently of one another. This uh, particular theory is based upon the assumption that international law and municipal legal system constitute two distinct and formally separate categories of legal orders because they differ as to their source, the relations they regulate, and their legal content. Therefore, uh, these two systems, according to uh, dualism or du dualist theory, are seen to be firmly independent from one another as, and neither can claim supremacy. The monist theory, on the other hand, developed by Kelsen, asserts that there is a relationship between national and international law, with international law being supreme. The monists argue that as law ultimately regulates the conduct of individuals, there is a commonality between international and national law, which both ultimately regulate the conduct of the individual. Therefore, each system is a manifestation of a single conception of law. That is the uh, concept of dualism and monism. On the other hand, we have uh, incorporation versus transformation. The doctrine of incorporation is expressed, of course, in Section 2, Article 2 of the Philippine Constitution which states that the Philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy and adopts the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land and adheres to the policy of peace, equality, justice, freedom, cooperation, and amity of all nations. Meaning that generally accepted principles of international law are now incorporated no, to our domestic laws for as long as they are generally accepted principles of international law. We are now bound by, uh, by these particular customs, the customary laws. And of course, this is of course expressly provided under the Constitution. And the principle of transformation or the doctrine of transformation requires the enactment by the legislative body of such international law principles as are sought to be part of municipal law. So there is a necessity for a uh, law no to to make international law or a, a particular international law to become a part of our of our local laws so what happens now if there is a conflict between international law and municipal law well it depends now if the uh, interpretation or the conflict involves an issue which is being decided by local tribunals, main, meaning Philippine courts. Now, if international law conflicts with the Constitution, then the Constitution prevails. Now, if it, the conflict uh, or international law conflicts with a particular statute, they are given a an equal standing in the law. Neither is superior to each other. 
Now remember that there is a uh, principle known as lex posterior derogat priori, which means that which comes last in time will usually be upheld by the municipal tribunal, meaning that a treaty may repeal a statute and the statute may repeal a treaty. Why is this so? Because remember that a treaty, once it is incorporated or once it is transformed into local law, is in itself now a, a domestic law and laws, of course, can repeal laws that were previously uh, enacted. So that is the principle there. Now, if the conflict, if there is a conflict between um, our national laws, even our constitution, and this is being heard by international tribunals, then international law prevails because international law is supreme in its own domain. Therefore, international law shall be upheld because international law provides the standards by which to determine the legality of a state's conduct. And again, there is also the principle that the state cannot make use or of its local laws or its municipal laws in order to avoid their obligations in international treaties or in international law. These are our references for our discussion in this particular topic. So next time again, thank you.